So I'm ready to take questions. If there are no questions, at, oh, sorry, Christian. <coughs> so the question was, do I have some numbers on cost? Good question. So I'll tell you the cost to build this facility first, and then the cost per acre foot of water. Uh, so the cost to build this facility, the construction cost alone was 55 million, but if we add our planning, our design, our sequel, with the construction cost, we say this facility was $72 million. Uh, and now, the question, so the question, the next question was, did we get any grants, federal grants? Yes, we did. We got ARA stimulus money, uh, 8.25. We had Prop 50 money, about 3 million. We had Prop 84 money, about 2.5 million. And the City of San Jose, in partnership with the district, provided $11 million because because we built this project in winter, the City of San Jose can take down some of the filters for maintenance and this plant can produce all the winter demand. So we had 11 million, so we have about $25 million in grants and cost share. So now the question on cost per acre foot. So if I look at true operations and maintenance costs, it's $550 per acre foot, which is very much in line, well, actually a little better than some of our, our imported supplies. So $550, and that is just O&M cost. It's not a fully loaded cost of capital. Question? Are you looking into, uh, for the whole full package here, are you looking into renewable energy to power up this facility in the future? Okay, the great question. So the question was, are we looking at renewable energy to power up the system, uh, the, or this whole treatment process? This is energy intensive more energy intensive than conventional treatment, but one-fourth the energy of desalination. So, I mean, in that way, it's, it's kind of a good option. However, it is, it's a pretty good chunk of, of energy. During the planning and design, it so happened I was in engineering and not in operations during the planning of this plan, we looked at, could we do solar? Because the city of San Jose had a lot of land around it, and the city was looking at a plant master plan. The city was looking at a wastewater plant upgrade master plan and they had a concept on the, on the books uh, called a solar farm. So we looked at when you build your solar farm we want to partner in and heads nodded yes. So we are looking at that. However for this first facility, this 8 million gallons per day facility, what we've done is our district is part of a, a group of water agencies that has uh, hydroelectric contracts. So we don't use, it's called PURPA, uh, Power and Water Pooling Act. And if PG and E rates are between 11 and 14 cents, hydroelectric rates are between 8 and 9 cents. So the power for this facility is a hydroelectric, a non-carbon based uh, fuel, but it's not solar. And in the future, when we build our future plants, it will, it will either buy into solar farms or wind farms. So we, we don't want the carbon based uh, carbon footprint. Are you also maximizing your biogas, uh, whatever you can get from the solids from the... Uh, the city of San Jose does uh, biogas uh, generation and reuse as part of their treatment trade. So they are using it. Christian? I assume you guys have completed all the permitting for the portable use with the drinking water? A good question. So her question was, she assumes we have finished all our permitting for our portable water system. No, we haven't. Right now, actually, we are going into what we call a design-build contract. Even though they talk about the Godzilla El Nino coming up in January, February next year, we don't know if that will be a one-shot thing and we're back again into a drought system. We don't know. So what our district board of directors have done is they have uh, agreed that they're going into planning, design, build contracts, and, and including the permitting for the future portable reuse. So they want to get a first portable reuse project in place in five years by 2020. So the question is, have we got the permits in hand? No. <laughs> but it's being worked on. <laughs> so how do you overcome the, uh, the gap factor for public accepting? 
Okay, so the, quest, the question is how do we overcome the yuck factor? One and a great question because that was the biggest hang up for portable reuse in the past. And I'll say in the past, the drought has been a great leveling uh, advertisement for portable reuse. Uh, having a demonstration facility where people walk, go through this facility, essentially, if some we used to do pre survey polls, you know, we had tablets with a survey on it. So, anyone going to a a, a tour comes and there's a pre-survey uh, a poll where they ask, would you drink treated or purified waste water? And in general, about 70%, even though they wanted to come for the tour, say no. Then they go through a tour, and in general tours, we don't offer a taste test. For the open house, we did. But in general tours, we don't. But we do show them the quality of the different uh, purified water. And at the end of the tour, 90% of them say yes, they will drink it. Because you know, they, they observe the technology, they, they see, they, they touch, they, they understand, and they become more accepted. The people who actually came to the open house and tasted it, they had an even higher amount of yes, they will drink it. Um, and they didn't even talk about putting it into the drum. They said they will drink it as straight up drinking it. So I think public outreach is important to overcome the yuck factor. Uh, the ability to understand how robust, or to, to understand the technology, the ability to understand or to trust the agency, that they will ensure that the operators and their maintenance uh, staff will, will always keep the, the systems in top-notch condition. Those, those are Question? Did the master plan include a second train facility for future needs? A second train facility for so the arrow? <laughs> yeah, like a, like doubling with exactly what you have to meet demand. In our initial planning phase the, uh, for this facility, there was the ability so you can mirror this and then uh, double it again. So we looked at that kind of expansion. So we did do that. Right. Question? Yes, uh, for your influence, how long do the uh, filters last? Before okay, the question was how long do these filters last? These are all membrane filters before fouling. The, there's actual lifespans for all of these pieces of equipment, and they're not like our conventional sedimentation basins and filter beds. This really, the it's, it's a fall system. Uh, it, the manufacturer says it has a life expectancy of seven years. Uh, some agencies uh, have run it for 10 years. And you don't just run it and say, oh, I'm trying to push it. You actually measure, you know, you do pressure decay tests, you do integrity tests, you look at pressure drops across the system. And then for the maintenance on a daily basis, you don't just do these integrity tests or, you know, watch pressure drops. You actually do and you take air and air is actually pumped through it and agitates it. And then it's backwashed with permeate or clean water. So we do that uh, every 37 minutes. And then every day, or every other day, we do a, this can handle chlorine. So it's washed with chlorine and then backwashed again. And then once a month, it has a, what we call an enhanced flux maintenance scanning. In the RO membranes, there's also, you watch the pressure drop so you know how much fouling it, it, it undergoes, and then it's backwashed. Now, all of these are automated. They're all built-in programs. Uh, but, but you know, you still have a human body out there making sure the programs are working correctly. And then, the, you know, the analyzers are working correctly. It's just because the analyzer reads 0 0.2 doesn't mean it's 0 0.2. You still have to go back and check that your analyzer is reading correctly. Or, and then take an actual physical sample and then send it to the lab and make sure your values match up. These can last for five years with good maintenance. Uh, and after that, you know, you replace these. That's $500 an element. And remember, we have seven of these elements in each of those big vessels. And we have 80 vessels in each train. But, of course, we're treating 8 million gallons per day. Uh, we want to build future portable reuse projects up to 30 million gallons per day to help meet our water needs. 
what do you do with the blackish water that comes out of the filter? or the, uh, the RO concentrate of red. So the question is, what do we do with... Okay, so we get the purified water to the center here. So what do we do with this? More saltier, or what we call the RO concentrate, or the reverse osmosis brine. We take that, we test it. And in partnership with the city of San Jose, San Jose has this big outfall that the rest of the treated wastewater that is not recycled or used by our facility is a whole chunk of water. See a chunk of water. <laughs> 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 a whole discharge going to the bay. This RO concentrate of brine is only a small, it's less than 1.5 million gallons per day. Uh, the RO concentrate is blended with their 80, 90 something million gallons, but it's, it's a small fraction and it goes out to the bay. So we did a, a desktop study. We can actually build three more to four more plants for blending in that, but, but what we do is we test the brine. We don't just say, okay, here, take this brine on a daily basis. It's <coughs> tested. Uh, toxicity of the brine is tested because we are very, very careful to maintain the aquatic, aquatic ecosystem to make sure the flora and the fauna in the bay are, you know, happy. Question? Do you know the conductivity reading of the, of the uh, brine that goes out? Yes. Uh, in, in terms of parts per million, uh -huh. and our conductivity of parts per million is uh, 0 0.6, um, the, uh, in terms of TDS, it's 4,500 to 5,000 parts per million or milligrams per liter TDS. <coughs> Bless you. you. It's about mm. five times as salty as the incoming water. Remember the mm. incoming wastewater is about 900? It's about five times the salinity of the outgoing. So compared to the, to like brackish bay water? The brackish still. bay water is between 5,000 and 10,000. Because it because of tidal influence in different times of the year, it ranges between 5,000 and 10,000. So it kind of matches. The, but we're, we're not just putting brine out. We're taking the brine and actually combining it <laughs> with the treated wastewater. Now, before I stamp, if any one, how many of you need contact hours? I have to stamp. I have been told I need to get your survey form filled up first. <laughs>